we are obsessed, obsessed with constantly raising the standards, constantly getting better, constantly becoming more excellent, constantly questioning and getting to better things. We basically make our living looking at what's priced in the markets and having thoughts independent of that and being right. I think Bridgewater is a true meritocracy. It's a place where we have a lot of young people that end up in a lot of positions that are rare in the industry. Fifty miles down the road from the commotion of Wall Street sits the pastoral New England town of Westport, Connecticut, and the sprawling campus of Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund in the world. And it's where co-chief investment officer Karen Carniel Tambor has been coming to work every day for the past 17 years, ever since she joined the firm straight out of Princeton. I remember seeing an on-campus presentation. I can't tell you any of the content that was in it, but man, the people who did it seemed so passionate about what they do. He thrived at Bridgewater, excelling in the firm's storied culture of an idea meritocracy. It's not uncommon to have someone who's a couple of years out of school, you know, kind of shamelessly, loudly critique something that they see and for their ideas to rise to the top and be kind of the core of what we then go after in our research. The Israeli-born Carniel Tambor is the firm's first female CIO and one of the most senior women in the historically male-dominated hedge fund world. She's also part of the vision for the next generation of Bridgewater, after billionaire founder Ray Dalio gave up control of his $125 billion firm last year. Many of the firms that have an iconic founder like Ray just never succeed in becoming something that outlives that iconic founder. You have the iconic founder and then when they're gone, that's it. And so the most important people to know is the success we've had in moving past such an iconic person to something that can outlast. Now Bridgewater became the largest hedge fund, if you use that phrase for a moment, uh, in the world. And it's been around longer than most hedge funds, uh, 50 years or so. Uh, because presumably its returns have been very good. So let's suppose I invested money at Bridgewater 50 years ago. Would I have gotten 8% uh, rate of return over the 50 years, 9%, 10%, double digit? How, what kind of rates of return do you give investors such that they keep giving you all this money? You know, the biggest thing I'd say is we have investors that invest with us for different reasons and we want to be in with them, partnering with them and figuring out what are they trying to do and what are their goals. So you ask, for example, what's the rate of return I can get? And the first answer I would give is, well, the rate of return you get depends on how much you're willing to put at risk. And you can take our insights and package them into different amounts of, of risk you're willing to take. There's a wide range. You have investors that come in and say, look, what I really need to do is, first of all, think about my liabilities and my pension fund, make sure I can pay out that pension, maybe hedge them. and the total return that you know an investor gets it, it depends what's their kind of governance what's their structure what do they want to set up and part of the reason we describe ourselves not as a quote-unquote hedge fund is because it people kind of narrow that into a box it doesn't include such a big part of what we do which is that collaboration of figuring out what kind of what are people really trying to achieve so you think inflation has been uh, beaten back sufficiently so that the fed now can begin to lower interest rates? Is that your view of what's likely to happen? Or what is your view on what the Fed is likely to do over the next six or nine months? You know, I think if I were in the Fed's shoes and when I hear Jay Powell speak, I think he's describing kind of a similar um, mental map. You don't have a lot of pressure on you. The bar is high to either raise or lower rates from where we are today. Um, when you look at what it takes to get fast rate declines, usually you need the economy collapsing pretty quickly. That's, there's a sense of urgency, right? The economy's collapsing, sense of urgency, lower rates as fast as you can. That's very far from where we are today. We don't have a collapsing economy creating that. And inflation is still uncomfortably high. It's not as high as it was. It has been coming down. But the impetus for I got to lower rates quickly is certainly not there. And so I think if I were in their shoes, I would think the bar is pretty high to move either way. I need to see how things play out. But I certainly am not excited about lots of rate cuts when inflation is still kind of a little stickier, higher than it should be. Conventional wisdom in Washington, which is not always right, in fact, it's wrong probably more than it's right, is that the Fed is likely to increase interest rates another 25 basis points this year. And sometime next year, the Fed might begin to lower. Uh, do you subscribe to that conventional wisdom or not? Well, I think the most important wisdom to be looking at and challenging is what's priced into the markets, right? Like we basically make our living looking at what's priced in the markets and having thoughts independent of that and being right. 
And when you look at what's in the bond market, it's uh, been pared back some, but it's a picture of a pretty good number of rate cuts coming our way starting next year, um, a pretty significant decline in interest rates. And uh, to me, that's hard to achieve without the economy slowing because the impetus is just not going to be there. Well, let's talk about the economy slowing. The R word is a word that scares a lot of people, recession. Some people think we're going to have a recession this year. Some people think we've dodged it. It's going to be a so-called soft landing. What is your view? I believe the economy is pretty resilient today, but that some of the tightening that has occurred is still kind of making its way through the system. Um, probably the most important part of that tightening that's still sort of making its way is the part that hits the bond market. So when the Fed goes and lets its portfolio of bonds roll off, the way that tightening hits is that eventually the Treasury's running a big deficit, someone's got to buy these bonds and it's not the Fed anymore. There's been a delay in kind of having that roll through into the markets because the Treasury issued T-bills at first against what happened and it had this big, you know, political mess in Washington, used its cash, worried about cash limits, debt limits, and so on. So there's been a delay in fully reaching the economy and markets with some of that tightening that's occurred. And so you're going to have more of this tightening kind of making its way through, particularly the financial markets. Will that be enough to actually upset the apple cart to be seen? I think probably not, but maybe. But if it won't be enough, what's going to happen is the Fed is going to be in a position to say, well, I can't ease interest rates as I'm priced to do. I've got to keep tighter than I expected, maybe even tighten again, because now inflation is you know, kind of sticky where it is. Let's talk about some investment themes. One of them is sustainability. Suppose somebody comes to you and says, I have a great idea. We can buy a oil refinery in some country, and it's really cheap. Shell or Exxon wants to sell it. We can make 10 times our money, but it's an oil refinery and you know, probably not contributing to climate change in a very useful way. Would you say, let's do it because we can make 10 times our money? Or do you say, no, we've got to worry about sustainability and you wouldn't do that? I think my job in that situation relates to the people at the end of the day whose money I'm investing, right? And so it's not my money that I'm putting to work. We have clients all around the world. And what you see when you look at our clients all around the world is that there's a subset of them. It's not all of them where their view of what their role is, their own sense of governance and what they're trying to accomplish is changing such that they would have answered your question in the past, absolutely, I want to buy the oil refinery, and today they'd answer it, no thanks, that's not what I want to be doing with my money for all of these different reasons related to what I want to do as a stakeholder, what I want to do with whoever's money it is. And so I think my job is to basically give great answers as investors around the world define their goals. And this goal of sustainability has been put out there. And I've tried to basically say, how do we give great answers to doing that well? Now, Bridgewater has been famous for a long time for its investments in China. And it's been a big bull on China for many, many years. Investing in China today is more complicated for all the reasons that we know. Today, do you look at investing in China? Or are you pulling back from investing in China? Or what's your assessment of the opportunity to invest in China today? I think if you run a global investment firm that invests in liquid markets around the world, you can't avoid studying and understanding China. It's just such a big economy that it has an influence on a lot of markets that you're touching. As an example, you know, you can't be in the commodity markets and not know what China's doing if they're producing and consuming, I don't know, half and more of the commodities, depending which commodity you're talking about. And so I feel it's extremely important that we have world-class knowledge and understanding of what's happening there and then what the second and third order effects are as that kind of makes its way through the financial markets and economies. So let's talk about your background for a moment. Um, where were you born? I was born in Israel. So in high school in Israel, you applied early decision to Princeton Yep. and you got in. Uh, suppose you hadn't gotten in, what would you have done? Uh, I would have tried to go to another American university. I really wanted to go to the American system. All right, so you get to Princeton and when you get there, do you say, after a year or so, these people are not as smart as I thought they would be, or they're smarter than I thought I would, they would be? Princeton blew my mind. I mean, it was probably the single most life-changing thing I did was come to Princeton because the world just, you know, opened up to me, right? Like the, the intellectual energy there, the degree of interest and whatnot. So I enjoyed every minute of it. And you get an interview at, uh, on campus with uh, Bridgewater, and they hired you, and you've been here for 15 years, more or less, right? Yeah, 17. So how did you happen to come here as opposed to going to Goldman Sachs or uh, something else? You know, 
it's, uh, you really don't know what you want to do when you're you know, 20, 19 on a college campus. And uh, this whole finance thing was, was on campus a lot. This is pre-financial crisis, so it was a very hot thing to do. But most people I talked to seemed not to like it that much. And I remember seeing an on-campus presentation. I can't tell you any of the content that was in it, but man, the people who did it seemed so passionate about what they do, just seemed so excited, so interested. And they talked about big lofty stuff, how the world works. Now you do not have an MBA. Many people in the business world tell young women, um, you know, there's a good networking world out there and go to Harvard Business School, Stanford Business School, University of Chicago School of Business, other good schools. Wharton, um, why did you choose not to get an MBA? And presumably at this point in your career, you're not gonna go back and get an MBA, but why do you think uh, you've been so successful without an MBA? I just loved what I was doing already. And so when I was at the spot, it would be kind of the natural take a break at an MBA. A lot of my friends that were doing it were kind of in jobs where the jobs were okay, but they didn't love, love what they were doing. And I also think a lot of places, the culture is such that if you're smart, as you're saying, you can sort of coast. You're good enough at what you do, you're doing okay, you're getting reasonable feedback, you can kind of coast. And the best way to do the next more interesting thing is actually to leave in some way. And our culture is just not like that, and people like and hate that. But if you are at all reasonable at what you're doing, people are going to give you the next challenge and the next challenge and keep pushing you. And so I found myself in a spot where I was constantly getting new challenges. A lot of, I think, the best mentorship I had at Bridgewater is because people often saw in me the potential to do things I didn't even see in myself yet. And if you find yourself in a place where you love what you're doing and you're getting challenged, you don't necessarily need to take that break. If you don't, it could be a great opportunity to go find out what is gonna be like that. It's a new day at Bridgewater. Billionaire founder Ray Dalio has been in charge since he started the firm in his two bedroom New York City apartment in 1975. And over the past 50 years, Bridgewater the firm had become synonymous with Dalio the man, until now. Last year, Dalio gave up control of the firm he built into the largest hedge fund in the world. And there is a new generation in charge. CEO Nir Bardia runs the day-to-day -day management of the firm. Karen Tarniel Tambor was tapped to become co-chief investment officer. She shares the title with Bob Prince and Greg Jensen. And Bridgewater's next chapter is in their hands. Bridgewater is, some people would say, the largest hedge fund in the world. You would say it's a large asset manager as well. But whatever you describe it as, it's a firm that was built many years ago, almost 50 years ago, I guess, by Ray Dalio. Ray has now ceded the operational control and the investment control to a new generation, and you're part of that new generation. Is that right? That's right. Well, there are three CIOs. Is that right? And how do you work? I mean, who, who makes this final decision out of the three? I mean, Ray's been an incredible mentor for so many years, and one of the things he really put in place, they were three CIOs you know, when Ray was here, and there are three CIOs now. He put in place a culture where people welcome and want other people to critique the ideas. Um, he used to talk about playing jazz together with the idea that every person brings something else, and together you get something that you know, one person alone can't do. And so if you think about the way we invest, we try to really think hard and understand cause-effect relationships that drive how economies and markets are going to behave. And the kind of culture that he created was one where you put those ideas sort of out there on a pedestal for people to critique and try to understand. So you want, what we really aspire to is, you know, at least three, ideally four or five, really thoughtful, knowledgeable people with independent ideas and perspectives debating every idea. What would you like the average person to know about Bridgewater today as opposed to the Ray Dalio era? Has it changed a lot? It's going to be pretty much the same. It's going to be better than it was. What do you, what do you want to tell people? I mean, the most important thing to know is the fact that we've succeeded in making a transition. You know, many of the firms that have an iconic founder like Ray just never succeed in becoming something that outlives that iconic founder. You have the iconic founder, and then when they're gone, that's it. And Ray's clearly at a stage where he's made a priority. And I think that's been a huge achievement. And so the leadership team we have today, you know, Nir, who's our CEO, Bob and Greg, who are uh, co-CIOs with me, that's a leadership team has been together for many years. I've been here 17 years. I've worked with these people for many, many years. We know each other well. We operate very closely. And the most important thing is we operate now as an institution that can outlive us. 
with you know an investment committee structure or with a structure that can bring in more talent. And so the most important people to know is the success we've had in moving past such an iconic person to something that can outlast. Okay, so let's talk about the investment process. You've got how many people at Bridgewater? It's a um, thousand people or? About a thousand. About a thousand people. So these people are looking at ideas all the time, presumably, and they're bubbling up, up to you, one of the other, uh, in the other two co-CIOs. And do you say, I like this idea, I, I like that idea, I don't like this idea, I don't like that one? Or do you say, I have ideas, and you ask people to go do the research to confirm your ideas are good? Well, what you really want is a mix. What you really want is a mix where you have a culture where people can bring up ideas and they have enough room in their jobs and time to have space to explore an idea. Because just saying like, oh, I have an idea, is usually not that compelling. You, you actually need some time to flesh it out, put together kind of a proof of concept and so on. So you want a culture where you enable that, where there's enough room for exploration, for entrepreneurship and so on. But at the end of the day, the best ideas get chosen, whether they're from the top or from the bottom, and get a lot of resources behind them to, to really drive them to completion. And so we have a, thought, a process that I think is thoughtful. We've really honed it in over many years to say, how do we aggregate all the ideas, make sure they have enough room to kind of breathe so they don't die on the vine, and then choose together as a team, you know, here's what we're really going to put our effort against. How long do you wait before changing policy when it's not working? In other words, you make a position, you take a position, and let's say three days later it's not working, a month later it's not working, six months later it's not working, do you finally get out of it or do you stay for years with positions just because you think you're right? No idea works every day, right? Every idea works differently in different environments and so on. And when you've done that degree of stress testing, when you've taken the time to take it out of your head, it's not just you getting up in the morning saying, I think X, but you really have all the rigor of stress testing it, you form expectations. And that means that the day we start an idea, we've decided ahead of time ahead of seeing how it performs, what are our expectations across a range of scenarios? What would failure and success look like? And then we know how to assess failure when we see it. Now, historically, Bridgewater does bring in a lot of really smart people from colleges, but they don't stay that long because it's a very tough place historically for people to deal with the self-examination that, that Ray has set up. Can you describe how that really works and is it still part of your system to have this kind of rigorous self-examination? You know, I think what really grabs people about the culture that's um, either difficult or exhilarating, depends how you feel about it, we are obsessed, obsessed with constantly raising the standards, constantly getting better, constantly becoming more excellent, constantly questioning and getting to better things. And that's easy to say, everyone says some version of that, but to actually do it, you need a culture where looking at what's happening and critiquing it we're coming from another perspective and saying what you did is bad is actually welcomed, is actually something that gets you promoted rather than fired. And that can be unnerving, especially you know, a senior person comes in, they're like, who is this 22 year old critiquing my work? Who do they think they are, right? But we really believe that you can't keep aspiring to get better and better. And the markets are hard. You're gonna get you know, eaten alive, things keep getting harder without that culture trying to bring out of people to, to, to find problems, to point them out. And what you see when people come to Bridgewater is they either love that, get excited about that, and they find that to be you know, a really cool place, and they themselves love the fact that we're gonna keep pushing them to keep getting better, keep improving. It means you get opportunities that you know, can come at you really fast because we're gonna keep pushing for that improvement. Or it's not for them. Uh, what's pretty cool about working here is it feels very tight. It feels like a family because so many people have kind of chosen it as their place. I think one out of four people have been here over 10 years. And so it feels like a place where a lot of people have chosen to make it their home. So uh, in the hedge fund world, let's use that world for a moment. You can also say the asset manager world. People look more like me than they look like you. You see a lot of older white men. You don't see a lot of younger women. So is it changing and is Bridgewater changing? And is it unusual to be a co-CIO of this large organization when you're a woman in your 30s and just had a, you know, a nine-month-old baby and a three-year-old baby? And is that unusual? Yeah, I think Bridgewater is a true meritocracy. It's a place where we have a lot of young people that end up in a lot of positions that are rare in the industry because we really do try to create a culture where we encourage people to speak up and critique. So it's not uncommon to have someone who's a couple of years out of school, you know, kind of shamelessly, loudly critique something that they see and for their ideas to rise to the top and be kind of the core of what we then go after in our research. And we think that culture is really, really important. It needs to be nurtured. It's not, you know, it's not easy. I remember the first time I had to 
call up late at night, it was Ray, to like critique some research he did and say, I don't think this research should be printed, is there issues with it? You know, it's scary to do that. It's always scary to, to have an independent thought that the rest of the leadership doesn't agree with. You have to actually create a culture that encourages that and that lets you see talent you otherwise wouldn't. Are there many senior women now at Bridgewater or in the hedge fund world generally? I haven't seen that many, relatively speaking. So you're one of the most senior women in the entire hedge fund world, even at your, in your 30s. Well, I certainly think that at Bridgewater, we have a ways to go, but that we've also made incredible progress. If you look at our um, you know, macro area, the area where we sort of think, what are we going to, what do we think is going to happen to growth and to inflation? That's run by a very talented woman named Kate Dunbar, who's, you know, close to 10 years younger than me. If you look at in commodities, we have a very senior woman named Elena, who is, you know, the senior person there. And so I think we've sort of done the best we can to say what's the best talent out there. Let's talk about the best investment advice you've ever received. You've been here for your entire career, 15 years. Has somebody given you great investment advice that you used or somebody not here given you great investment advice you've used? I would say, you know, Ray's obviously been a really important mentor to me. And the advice he gave, but also seeing him do it live, uh, was always about embracing what you don't know and asking the questions. And I've found that that's the most powerful thing. It's very easy in an investment conversation to get sucked into the couple of kind of solid pieces of evidence you can put together and the things that you see. And you have to do that. You have to spend lots of time and understand the case well and whatnot. But it's a lot harder to step back and say, what are the assumptions this is resting on that I haven't thought about? And what are the things I don't know? And how do I really embrace thinking about that? Most common mistake investors, average investors make is what in your observation? Being overly impacted by what the recent past has been like. And sometimes recent can also be decades and their lifetimes. And so if you look at what it's like today to be an investor, right, most of the living time of most investors today, we were in one economic regime. And you know, rates were low, equities had a great run, the US was the best outperformer, there were no geopolitical issues. It's very hard, or inflation wasn't a problem, it's very hard to get yourself really in the shoes of what it's like when the markets don't feel like what you've experienced, whatever you've experienced is what feels real to you. But there are lots of other times in history and place in history where markets didn't feel that way. And so people just get very anchored to what they've personally experienced. So let's suppose I meet you at the proverbial cocktail party we've talked about, and I, I say, look, I'm not that wealthy, but I do have some money I've saved up. I've got $100,000. Um, I'm not a billionaire, I'm not a millionaire, but I've got $100,000 and I don't want to lose it. What should I do with 100000 What would you tell that person? Well, today my first question would be, how much of it is already sitting in just T-bills? Because lots of people in that situation have a lot of money in savings accounts that are not yet even paying what T-bills give, and that is a risk-free way for you to not worry about the money and still make a higher yield than you are today. That's the first thing conversation I'd have. I find too many people who talk to me at a cocktail party skip from I have a zero yielding savings account to let me go invest in a few stocks I like without just you know, getting the highest yield they could.